morning. Uh, good morning. I think we both did better the second time. All right. Our reading this morning will be from Romans 6, 1 through 7. That was Romans 6, 1 through 7. If you're using a Bible from the seat in front of you, it's on page 942. If you're reading from your phone, I suppose if you have a pen or marker, you could write 942 at the top, and we'll all be reading from the same thing. So, uh, by way of introduction, I'm supposed to do that part. Uh, my name is Casey Smith. For those of you that don't know me, my wife Dana and I have been coming to the door now for 10 years. Uh, we have been group leaders for six of those years. Uh, we have two sons uh, running around the church. My, my son Carter is 12, and Nate is 9. Uh, for any other details about my personal or professional life, I'll be in the lobby <laughs> later. Just line up single file so there's not a rush. Uh, Romans 6, let's read together. Uh, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Good morning. My name is Mark McPherson. I am overstudent ministry here at the Door Church. Privileged to be on our preaching team. Uh, excited to dive into this text in the book of Romans. Um, when God saved me from myself, this text allowed me to really understand what was happening in my heart. It gave words to what I was feeling. Uh, and so this morning, I want to pray over the sermon that, that, that I have a zeal for this text and for, for what Paul is communicating here. And I pray that uh, God would continuously fuel that zeal, um, that I would speak with a reverence as I speak on uh, this topic, because I'm going to get real fired up. And um, also pray that the sermon has an ending, um, because I could talk about it for a while. Please, please pray with me. Father, you are so good to us. You are first in our hearts. I pray that your spirit would allow us to see that so clearly this morning. I pray that we would see Christ. And I pray that you would allow us to wear your righteousness this morning. Father, I pray that we would walk out of here zealous to live for you. Father, let my zeal, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Convict us this morning. Conform us in the image of Christ. And comfort us by your word. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Sermon title this morning is Walk in the Newness of Life. Walk in the Newness of Life. And I want to show how, how grace produces freedom under three headings. Grace produces freedom that is untapped, united, and ultimate. Untapped, united, and ultimate. On August 23rd, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King gave his infamous I Have a Dream speech. Dr. King was looking at the words of our Constitution and looking through them to see God's word. He was applying the freedom of the Bible, the freedom that's found in Christ, to our Constitution. He was trying to strip people of identities that were built around race. And as he stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial, he said these words. He said, in a sense... We've come to the nation's capital to cash a check. That deep within the words of the Constitution, behind those words are the words written by the Holy Spirit of ultimate freedom. And that we are to tap into those words, tap into the Spirit of Christ that we might have ultimate freedom. 
He said on that morning, we refuse to believe that the bank of, in, of justice is bankrupt. Christian, this morning, brother, sister, family, this morning, where are we believing that God's grace and freedom is bankrupt? Where do we believe that his bank is empty for us? Where are we not cashing a check this morning? Where is there freedom in your life that is not untapped? Or that is untapped? Verse 1, read it with me. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? This is a question that I tackle with every time I'm up here because it's part of my testimony. But it's a great, great question and theologically speaking, and logically speaking, this is the great question. That if grace is given to us, that all of our sins are going to be forgiven, and Jesus is going to give us a perfect righteousness, he's going to give us a perfect record, then why not continue sinning? Why not continue sinning? It's all covered by grace. So why not sin all the more and make his grace look that much more great? What Paul is saying, us, is saying to us this morning is that if that's our answer, to the gospel. If that's how we look at the gospel, you don't understand the grace in which you stand. You're not understanding what you have received. See, Paul says, what shall we say then? And Paul is answer, he's asking this question to, to, to what has been delivered. In the first, chi- five, the first five chapters, he's delivered us this gospel. One of grace, that is, that means we don't deserve it. We can't earn it. It's actually ill-deserved. We don't deserve this gospel at all, this good news that Christ is our redeemer. And it's a gospel of righteousness, that, that we have an awful track record, but Jesus is going to give us his perfect track record. He's going to give us his righteousness. His merits are going to be given to us. And this is a gospel that's received and not achieved. And this is groundbreaking. This is something that's never before been seen or heard about and still nothing today is anything close to it. Because every religion in the world says you have to earn it, that you have to be good, that you have to do these things in order that you might receive salvation, that you might earn your salvation. And it's, it's not even just religion. It's, it's the things that we live for. Every identity you have says you need to earn to earn to be good. I have to do all these things to be a good father. I have to do all these things to be a good employee. And here, Paul's been delivering us a gospel, good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that is purely received. And at the latter part of chapter 5, what Paul did is he radically placed us in two different camps. You are either in Adam or in Christ. Either you belong to God or you are not God's. He has placed us in two camps. And he continues in saying, are we continue to sin that grace may abound? That, that if we're following Adam, we're on one road. And this road is leading us to, to sin and ultimate death. And now we've been plucked from that road and put on a new road. We're on a new journey. We're following Christ. And this road leads to life. It leads to following him in obedience. It leads to righteousness. It leads to eternal life. And we've been, we've been plucked from this road and put onto Christ's road. And, and Paul's asking us, are we going to to continue to walk down this path of Adam when we have the grace and the gift of Jesus Christ and to, and to follow him. Paul is saying, <laughs> what are you talking about, Willis? What are you doing? He's saying that if we continue to walk down this path of Adam just to show that Jesus is good, we're still in chains. We're still in chains He says in verse 2, by no means, by no means, no way. This only shows that we're not understanding the grace and the freedom that we have in our new master. That we have a new master and we don't have to live in chains, but we can walk with him, follow him in righteousness. See, everybody has to live for something. Even atheists know that. Bob Dylan knows that. Jordan Peterson knows that. Carl Jung knows that. Everybody has a spiritual master. Everybody has something that they're living for. Nowadays, we call it our identity. 
We all have some way to label ourselves, and this label is what we are squeezing to find our security and our significance. We're trying to squeeze the security and significance out of things that are good things, but not ultimate things, like our, like our children and like our careers. And Jesus is here to free us of these identities that only keep us in chains. In Matthew 6, verse 24, he says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. If you don't see where you're failing to put God first in your life, you are going to be radically out of control, and you are going to be doomed to suffer as the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word of God in you and prove it to be unfruitful. What that means is that if you are living for another identity, what's going to happen is it's going to choke you out. And the freedom that you have in Christ, you will not experience because you are going trying to live up to, you're going to try to live up to this identity and when you fail, it will have no grace for you. It will have no mercy for you. Identities in this room that we all carry that if you fail to meet their requirements, you will be canceled. You will be fired. And what Jesus is trying to show us is that our freedoms are at war. See, we think freedom is the ability to do whatever we want, but we don't have freedom. We have freedoms. And we have to choose the right freedoms. My question is, where is Adam still fighting for freedom in you? Where is the flesh in you still fighting to hold on to an identity that you might squeeze the significance and the security out of? And we do this every week. We talk about your family. We talk about your kids. We talk about your job. But let me give you a test, a way that you can find the identity in your heart that you're holding on to tightly. Where is the place where when you're refused whatever it is, when you're refused this thing, that you're not only angry, but you're unforgiving to the person who refused it to you. Where is the place where anger turns into unforgiveness and hatred? Where's the place in your life where you're not only afraid to take the next step, but you're actually paralyzed? Crippled by anxiety. Don't know how to move forward. What's the place in your life, the thing in your life, the person in your life who if you were to lose it or lose them, not only would it bring sadness, but it would deem your life worthless as well. What's the thing that you cannot lose, not only because it's going to bring you sadness, but your life won't be worth living at all. These are the places in which we are making idols. These are the places where Adam is holding tight to an identity. These are the places where our freedoms are at war. Tim Keller wrote this sentence, and I love this sentence. And my poor wife has to hear this sentence all the time. Tim Keller said this, he said, Freedom isn't the absence of constraints. It's choosing the liberating constraints. Constraints that will liberate you. Freedom is not being able to do whatever you want. Freedom is choosing the right constraints that liberate you. And we know this because reality clashes against one another and we begin to experience breakdown in our life. And it's not, it's not spiritual, it's physical too, it's all over the place. I can't have the freedom to be healthy and to have a good heart and to have uh, muscles and, and have longevity in my life and, and, and a good body and the freedom to eat whatever I want. I can't have the freedom of a healthy heart and the freedom to eat haagen 24 hours a day. I can't have that freedom. At one point, they will clash. That's just common sense. I can't have the freedom of being a professional and the freedom of laziness. I can't have the freedom to be late and to never show up and to be a mess and have the freedom to show up and be professional and actually earn some time off. You can't have the freedom of both. You have to choose the freedom which liberates you. 
And the same things that are true physical are true metaphysically, meaning in the spirit. That you cannot have the freedom of self and the freedom of love. You can't have the freedom of self and the freedom of love. I can't tell my wife that she needs to give me the freedom of love. She needs to support me. She needs to love me. She needs to be there for me. And I, have to tell, I can't tell her that I'm also, I also need the freedom to, to, to you know, talk to other ladies and, and not come home when I don't want to come home. And I need my freedom as well. That's not going to work out. She'll tell you. That, it, I'll tell you. It's the same thing on my side. It's not going to work out. You can't have the freedom of love and the freedom of of self, one place where I hear it over and over and over again, and, and I just love this song because it's so sad, and I, I really do love sad music, and I don't know why. Um, Adele has an album out. Uh, it's, it's a heartbreak on vinyl. It's, it's uh, just a beautiful album, but she has one song that's called My Little Love. And in that song, what's happening is she has a freedom because of the voice, the gift that she has. She has this freedom to be a superstar and to travel the world and, and to entertain people with her voice. But she's battling and clashing with the freedom of being a mother. And they're clashing and she doesn't know what to do. And so she sings this to her son who can't be more than five years old. She, see, she sings these words. I, I'm, I feel so bad to be here when I'm so guilty. I'm so far gone. You're the only one who can save me. See, what she's expressing to a child is that you're the only person who can give me significance and security. Her realities are clashing. Her freedoms are clashing. Because she can't have the freedom of self and the freedom of love. And God wants you to know ultimate freedom from his love. To be in a relationship with him. To be in a relationship, if only one person picks up sacrifice and service, it's not love, it's exploitation. And for us to experience the freedom of Christ, we need to pick up following him, picking up our cross, and live a life of service and sacrifice unto him because that's what he's done for us. And this, this is, it hits so close to my heart because this is my story. Because when I was a kid, my dad was a pastor, and he fell from, from the pulpit. And, and I remember hearing those things. You're saved by grace. You're saved by grace. And so I thought, you can do whatever you want. I can do whatever I want. Until I read the words of Christ. When I got to Revelation 3, and he says, you say you're rich. You say you're rich. We do this all the time. When we're doing well in this identity that we've propped up for ourselves, we say, I'm doing pretty well. And when that identity goes south, we go south. And Christ is saying, you say you're rich, but you're poor and you're naked and you're blind. You say you're rich, but you're enslaved to this identity. Which feels good when you're doing good, but crushes you when you fail to live up to it. And he's saying, you say you're rich, but come get riches from me. Well, where you fail, there's grace. Where you fail, there's redemption. He says, come get riches from me. He says this to the Jews in John uh, chapter 8. He says this in verse 33. These are the Jews talking to Jesus. They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And see, what are they doing? They're saying, we're children of Abraham. We have the law. We're good people. How can you say we're slaves to anybody? What are they doing? Taking a good identity and they're making it their all. They're making it everything and it becomes something that holds them captive. And Jesus answers them in, in John 8, verse 37. He says, if you know, uh, uh, I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. As we hold on to identities, we choke out the word of God. Proving it unfruitful as we hold on to identities that we think are most important to us and that give us life, we will choke out the true freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. True freedom. If we choose to lose freedoms for each other, then a true love relationship begins. And Christ is showing us this morning that there's no greater love than a friend laying down his life for you. And he's done that for us this morning. He's done that for us on the cross. My question is, will we continue to exploit his love for us? Or will we choose to love him and follow him in obedience? Jesus says, 
The one who follows my commands is he who loves me. Where do we need to tap into his grace this morning that we might be freed from the shackles of false identity? See, tapping into the grace of Christ, it kills false identity. It breaks the chains of false identity and then it allows his freedom to ring. We break the, the chains of identity by coming to him and being united with him. United with him. Secondly, united. Look at verses 2 through 5. He says, By no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might, be, might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. See, do you know that Freedom isn't trying to choose whatever you want to do, but true freedom is being united with the Savior. That's true freedom. It's being united. It says, we who died to sin have have been baptized into Christ. We've been baptized into his death, which means that his death to sin is our death to sin. His death to sin is our death to sin. And this phrase, we're dead to sin, can sound very intimidating. Like what, I'm not, I'm not supposed to sin at all anymore? Because if that's true, I think we would all realize we're in some grave trouble. But here's the beauty of the text. is yes, we will still have sin, but sin will no longer have you. We will still have sin, but sin will no longer have you. We are dead to it by being united into his death. I want to try to tell you five ways not to think about this. N-O-T, five ways not to think about dead to sin in this passage. Here's five things I don't want you to think when you hear dead to sin. Don't think it's you'll no longer want sin because you will. Don't think it's you no longer ought to sin because, duh. Uh, It's no longer you're, you're slowly moving away from sin because sin still lives within you. It's no longer that you should renounce sin. Like, it's, it's not like this idea, like, I just got to come up here and say I love Jesus, say I don't like sin and get baptized in the water and I'm good. Because that's just renouncing sin. It's not that. And it's no longer feeling guilty of sin because we all feel guilt and we all feel remorse for our sin. What the text is saying is that sin no longer has a reign over us. Like, sin's not in charge anymore. Sin's no longer the all-powerful one over you. That's what the text is saying. I have the worst example here, and I've, I tried in the first gathering to make it sound a little bit better in my mind, and it didn't work out. But I'm going to say it again, and it's going to be awkward again. Um, the best way I can think about this is like, you know, you, you know, you might have ex-girlfriends, I have ex-girlfriends, but you know what? They're dead to me. And not like, you know, they're people. I'm not trying to say like they're dead to me. But the, you know what I'm trying to say is like, like you know, the... <laughs> What I'm saying is that they are kind of dead to me because the powerful love of my wife has deemed them defeated. The beauty of my wife has deemed them defeated. The loyalty and the trust I have in my wife has deemed them defeated. And when we look at this text, when it says we're dead to sin, what we are seeing is that sin no longer has power over you. Sin no longer has the ability to send you to hell and no longer has the ability to separate you from him. Sin can no longer make your life negative and sin can no longer take away the positivity that comes from Jesus Christ. Us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, which means that sin no longer dictates how God sees you. He died to our sin once and for all. When he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. And what I need you to hear today is that when you are united with Christ, God does not see your past. When he looks back at your past, when you look back on your past, you can see Jesus covering all those sins for God. And as far as east is west, 
I got a past this morning that I need to be dealt with, and it's dealt with in Christ. And when I look at my future, I see Christ. That nothing can separate me from him. And one day I'm going to see him face to face. He's taken my past and he's given me his spirit that I might live for him until I see him face to face and he's always with me. This is true baptism. Matthew 3 verse 11 says it this way. John the Baptist says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. See, this is what it is to be baptized by the Spirit, is that as you are united with Christ, he comes and makes a home in your house, I mean your heart, and so that he can show you that your past looks like his past. Jesus is giving you his past. That your past looks like the perfect record of Jesus Christ. Everything he did, the father looks down and says, you have the merits of Christ on you. Your past is forgotten. He's taking your past. That's why we get baptized. Baptizing is a symbol of the reality that that's true in my heart, that I've been united with Christ. This wedding ring is just a symbol of the love that me and my wife has, but that love is in my heart. And as we're reunited with Christ, we begin to realize that he has hidden us in himself. I pray the Spirit allows you just to wear that this morning, that you can see that with your eyes, that your past is forgiven. It's dealt with. Colossians 3.3 says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You are hidden in him. And if you're hidden in Christ, your past is dealt with and your future is secure. And verse 4 says, Just as Christ was raised, we too might walk in the newness of life. Because we know that we're going to see him face to face. We walk with the unshakable truth, an untouchable reality. We walk with the ultimate security and significance that we need. Like nothing can touch you. We are going to live with him in perfect peace. And we can live now following him, knowing that every time we follow him, we're following our Savior, we're being made more into his image. And every time we fail, there's grace and not being canceled. There's redemption and not you being thrown to the wayside. You're not getting fired from his family. Nothing can separate you. Paul says, I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels or rulers, nor present things to come, nor powers, nor heights or death or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Your past is redeemed. Your future is secure. That's freedom. Freedom. You're free from yourself. It's not about me. It's not about what I'm living for. It's all about him and what he's done. And when I see that, I'm united with him in his death. And I rose with him in his resurrection. There is freedom. This is the gospel. It's the power of salvation that brings fire from the spirit to live for him in true freedom. Titus 3.5 says it this way. He saved us not because of our works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. See, he's bringing his life to live in us. And as he lives in us, we have the ability to walk in righteousness, walk in good works, walk in obedience, being conformed into Christ. And when we fail, he's there to be our advocate. He's there to tell you to get back up. He's there to be our intercessor that covers us in his righteousness, that reminds us that, hold up, your past is forgiven and your future is secure. He is coming to show us that we are free. Dobby is a free elf. He's a free elf. Harry Potter gives Dobby this little, this little I don't know what he's a little ugly dude. He gives him a sock and he gets this sock and he's free. And he had, a, a, he had a wicked master, an evil master. And as soon as he gets this piece of clothing, he's deemed free. And what does he do? He, he uppercuts this guy. And he, he looks at Harry and says, Harry, what can I do with my life to serve you? That's freedom. That's the response to freedom. That is the correct response. That's true hope. That's true freedom. Christ has given us more than a sock. He's given us his righteousness to robe us with. 
We're covered in the robes of righteousness by Jesus Christ. He came and took flesh and died in our place so that we might have a perfect record. How are we to respond? See, this is the beauty of the kingdom. This is the beauty of the future kingdom that is to come, that right now the power of that future kingdom is deposited in your heart right now. Like you can cash that check. And you can walk in the power of the resurrection of Christ. See, we thought that, that Jesus was going to come and, and fix up our, our, our little homes. We think our hearts are like little cabins that Jesus comes and he fix them up and he'll fix up this spot and he'll fix up this spot. But Jesus is a king and he deserves a, a castle. And so he's going to do construction on your heart. He's a king who deserves a mansion and he's going to break down some parts in your heart that he might be suitable to live in it. See, we come to Christianity thinking that we might find some inner peace and we might find some security. We might find some of these things that's going to help us, some inspiration. But Jesus says, I'm coming into your heart so I can make you a mirror. That my goodness might reflect off of you and into this world. He comes to live inside of you that the old you would die. That you would die to yourself that the old self will be crucified, that when you look in the mirror and you look in your own eyes, you would see the hope of glory. You would see Christ Jesus in you. That's freedom. Freedom to see Christ in you and to walk it out because he's with you always. Ultimate freedom is our unity with Christ that frees the captives and lets his freedom ring. It's ultimate freedom. Lastly, it's ultimate freedom. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who you are in him this morning. Every time we sin, we're forgetting who we are in Christ. Do you need a Mufasa moment on the clouds right now? Remember who you are. You are my son. You can live in freedom. You can let him live in you. Verses 5 through 6 says it this way. We're united with him in a death like his, and we certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know the old self was crucified with him. We've been paid for. We've been redeemed. We've been ransomed. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says it this way. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. You were ransomed. And when you see the person who has ransomed you, when you see the king who laid down his life for you, you know what happens in your heart as you're united with Christ is sin actually does grow bitter. Don't trample on the good gift that he's given you. Don't trample on his very heart. We can actually see those five things that this text isn't saying and see them rightly in the spirit. That actually, when I know that sin no longer has power over me, but Christ is my king, that I actually don't want to sin. I know I shouldn't sin. And actually, by the spirit of God, sin is moving away from me, and I do renounce it. And you know what? In the freedom and grace of Christ, I'm no longer guilty of it. That is true freedom. We have all the resources we need to walk in righteousness and to follow Christ. We must just deploy them. We need to cash a check. The church father, Augustine, was dealing with a temptation. And the temptation spoke to him. And the temptation said, Augustine, hey, it's me. Do you remember me? And Augustine says, yes. And then she says, the temptation says, where have you been? And Augustine says, Yes, it's me you're talking to, but it's not I. Yes, I remember you. Yes, it's me, but it's no longer I who you speak to. When temptation calls, we have a new master who allows us to walk in freedom. When Christ is our master, he's our true king that allows us to walk in ultimate freedom as we follow him in right living, in righteousness, in perfect record. But when we fail, there is grace. When we fail, there is mercy. And I think this morning we all live with the scars of living for identities in this world. And we're terrified. We're terrified of picking a new master. Because we have genuine scars of old masters who have treated us 
awfully. Masters that don't fulfill our souls. And I'm compelling you this morning to see that it can all change when someone walks into your life and uses their power to serve you rather than abuse you. And I've seen that. I've seen it in, I've seen it in a person. Christ, I've seen Christ in a person. His name is Scott Brooks. He's our lead teaching pastor. Scooty Boot. And I think about what he's done in my life. And he came into my life as a young, I was just a young, broken dude. And he came into my life, and at every single moment, he empowered me. And at every single moment, he built me up. And at every single moment when I was wrong, he told me the truth. And at every single moment, he had the ability to use his power to serve me, he has. And he's brought me into this position, and he's built me up, and he still does. And tomorrow's Monday, and he's going to do it tomorrow. And I'm going to see him tomorrow, and he's going to do the same thing, because that's Christ in him. Because he's used his power to serve someone instead of abuse them. And how much more is that true for our King and Savior who had all power, who lived in all glory, who had ultimate freedom, and yet he came down into this world to serve us and to set us free. How much more is it true for the infinite King who came and took my place when I deserve death and he said, I give you life. Your career won't die for you. And your job won't die for you. Your, your kids and, your, and your, your spouse cannot save your soul, but the king did. And he will. And he's calling you this morning to let go of the places in which you have an idol. A, a place where you have an identity, where you're trying to find significance and glory. He's, he's calling you this morning to be liberated, to be set free from these things in which we hold tightly to. Look through the words of Dr. King. When Dr. King says that, 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 that he wants a nation in which black men and white men, Jew and Gentile, Protestants and Catholics can be stripped from these titles and they can be united. It only comes from the freedom of being united with Christ. And as we're united with Christ, we truly can join together and sing the hymns of the Negro spiritual that says we're free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty we're free at last. It's only in Christ in which we have absolute freedom. That's the point of verse 7. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. See, the slave has no place in the father's house. The slave works hard but knows at one point his work will be over. But John 8, 3, 6 says that if the son comes and sets you free, you will be free indeed. See, the son comes to bring liberty. The son comes to bring you into the house. The son comes to give you an identity of son or daughter that you might have a... a a united relationship with him in which you know that his death has secured you. And his resurrection means that there's life for you now, that you can live a life now that's unfading and unstoppable and filled with significance. Filled with the hope of glory. And so I stand with Dr. King this morning and I stand with the Apostle Paul and I stand with John the Baptist and the prophet Isaiah as I cry out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And that word was Christ himself. And he comes and he took on flesh. And he dwelt among us full of glory and truth and he died in my place and he rose from that grave that I might have life and have it abundantly and my past has been forgiven and every day I live, I live unto him and if I die, it is gain and if I live, it is Christ and I live with that hope and that truth until I see him face to face. To what I see dimly now, I see face to face. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this morning we would let go of the things that we're holding on to so tightly by ministering to you, by telling you how great you are, by loving what you've done for us.
can only do that if you open our eyes to see your son, to see him more clearly, to see that he's come to break the chains and break the shackles of false identities that we hold so tightly to. Jesus, I pray our hearts would melt as you say you've come to free the captives. Let us live with a hope and a power to walk with you, to know that you're with us until the end of the age and to live in righteousness. Let our sin grow bitter and let obedience become a well of living water in which we know your love more and more. Conform us into the image of Christ. Let us worship you now in spirit and truth and sing of our freedom. It only comes from the name in which all men are saved, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.